Well, there are some sermons as a pastor I love to preach. Then there are those sermons which hurt me to preach. Well, the sermon today is one of the latter. I'm reminded of 2 Timothy 3.16, however, in which we read all scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And so we come now to a section of scripture that is so terrible. It is one of the most terrible sections in the Bible, I feel. It is a picture of the human condition when being abandoned by God. When we are abandoned by God. And unless we understand the depth and the depravity of our condition, we will not understand the need of a Savior. May God be merciful to us and be favorable towards us. Let me begin with prayer. Father, as we come now to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to the end of the chapter, I pray, Lord, that your spirit is already working and that you will challenge us as a people, that we will look to you and seek you and find you and follow you and live for you, God, our Savior and Lord. And some so now come to each one who's partaking in this service, who's partaking in the message today. And I just pray, God, that you will touch them and that you will help them in their mind and in their heart and in their very being to grasp the message that you have for them today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. So Paul starts telling us the good news here in Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 16. And before giving us the bad news, the apostle is wise to remind us of the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel, verses 16 and 17. Let me read it. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It literally means good news. Good news about what God has done on our behalf. On our behalf through Jesus Christ. It is very good because we are very bad. And at worst we're unable to make it good at all. We cannot fix the problem that we have. All of us are sinners. We're sinners from birth. And this places us at a distance from God. It separates us from God. But Jesus has provided a way for us to be right with God, to be reconciled with God, to be brought back into a relationship with God. This is the good news, the good news of the gospel. And this good news of the gospel is, first of all, nothing, says Paul, to be ashamed of. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Why should he or we be ashamed of it? Because the world opposes it and ridicules it. And we are far more in tune with the world than we realize, my friends. In our North American culture, it exhibits a certain veneer of religious tolerance. So most will not scorn Christianity openly, but it is there nonetheless, and it rears it, its head from time to time. It's been my opinion, for instance, that the media today will report far more about other faiths than it will about the Christian faith. And if it does report about Christianity, it's usually and often in a negative light. The city, for instance, in which we have our, our church in, would not allow us to place a cross on the cell tower. Even though other cities have it and allowed it, ours would not. You see, Paul enjoyed nothing more than to be known as a Christian. Jesus warns us in Luke chapter 9, verse 26, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory. 
Here's the crunch for many who follow Jesus. They often act like SS Christians, Secret Service Christians. Yes, many act that way, Secret Service Christians. When we're in the huddle and we're together with God's people, we're willing to talk about Jesus, maybe. But when we walk out the front doors, we're undercover agents and barely do we ever talk of Jesus. You see, Paul was unashamed, and it should be no different for us. Why? Why should we not be ashamed? We should not be ashamed of the good news of the gospel, because the good news of the gospel is powerful, says Paul. It's powerful. It's God's power displayed. The proclamation of the gospel has the power to change a life. You can't change a life. You tried it with your kids, perhaps. <laughs> I cannot change a life. But the gospel can change a life. There is power in it. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. You see, my friends, the gospel is the power by which salvation is imparted to the living soul. It is able to penetrate to the deepest part of who we are. The power is not in the eloquence of the preacher, nor of the preacher's education. It is the power of God to transform hearers from death to life. It appears from a human point of view to be foolishness. It doesn't make any sense at all. It, uh, it seems foolish to many. But that is how God has chosen to invest his power. I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 1.21. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Did you hear that? It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And you know, every preacher, I'm sure they do, because I know I do, feel at one time or another that in coming to the pulpit, that to the natural mind it seems absurd, and that the preaching is incapable of doing any good to the listeners, about as much as preaching to corpses in a cemetery. <laughs> that is, that is, unless God does a work. Unless God does a work. We should not be ashamed of the good news of the gospel because it is powerful. And secondly, it's the way of salvation. It's the way of salvation. It's about saving, it's, it's about saving ourselves because left to ourselves, we're in big trouble. It's the sin problem. We are like the person who has fallen into icy water in the wintertime. We will not last very long without help. And the good news is that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ has reconciled us. He's brought us back together with God to himself, allowing us to have relationship. Jesus Christ has reconciled us to others. In being forgiven, we recognize the need to forgive to others as well, thus opening the way to love them as Jesus loves us and to be reconciled to them. Jesus reconciled us also to ourselves with the power of the Holy Spirit invested in us. We can become all that God has meant for us to be. It's that what we talked about last week. We are saints in the eyes of God, but he also desires us to become saintly. And this is a work of the Holy Spirit. And God has, in Christ has, has given the Holy Spirit to us to those who believe. He's not left us on our own. Hallelujah. In Christ before God, we truly are now seen as saints. And as we continue to live out our lives, it's a work of the Holy Spirit to help you to become saintly. Or as I prefer to say it, it is the work of the Holy Spirit to make you become more like Jesus Christ. It's a process. It takes time. Frustrating at times, because it always seems, doesn't it? 
You might agree with me, for every one step you take forward, <laughs> another time you take two back, or maybe even three. <laughs> How many times? How many times do we promise God that we will not sin, that we will do better, but we continue to fail? And it is at this point that the way of salvation really kicks in. In Christ, we are seen as holy. If not, then we perish. This is the way of salvation which is made possible through Jesus. We stand in him. We are saintly in him. Yes, we are to become more like him. Yes, that is his desire for us. Yes, he has given us the Holy Spirit to that end. And yes, we should be becoming more and more like him. And we will if that is our desire. But we will never arrive in this side of heaven. And that's why we need Christ on our behalf. Amen? Yes. And lastly, we should not be ashamed of the good news of the gospel because it is powerful. It is the way of salvation. And it comes by faith. It comes by faith. What is faith? Well, we've talked about that. Faith is hearing God's word. And when you hear it, you act on it. God's word says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe. And when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, because you take that action within your being to believe, Scripture says you will be saved. And you will be saved. You believe and you will be saved. Faith then is believing that Jesus died for you. Faith is believing that Jesus forgives your sin. Faith is believing that he accepts you into the family, into God's family. And then you start living and acting like it. You begin to act like you're a child of God. You begin to act like you belong to him. You begin to act like Jesus wants you to act, the way he told us to act. Faith and obedience cannot be separated. We have faith, we believe, but then we have to do what we know we need to do. And they go together. True faith always produces obedience. And that obedience leads to a transformed life. And that's how we become more and more like Jesus. And that's how we become more and more saintly. But now, but now the apostle begins to lay out the bad news. The bad news. And the bad news is like a violent tornado with a massive and quick and downward spiral. It begins with the failure of mankind to acknowledge, the failure of mankind to worship, and the failure of mankind to live for God. And the failures continues, and they continue. And it's like a drop over Niagara Falls to the crushing rocks below. And the scene is one of one big gory mess. And so the apostle brings us to the bad news of God's wrath in verses 18 to 32. I'm not going to read all the verses. I hope you have your Bibles open. Read them there. Read it. It's one big mess. It is. It's bad news. And the bad news of God's wrath is what it starts out with. When you understand the bad news, it often accentuates the good news. When you understand the bad, the good looks pretty good. In my sense of the day that we live in is that many people are unconcerned with the gospel because they do not grasp. They do not grasp the gravity of God's wrath to come. If people were more sensitive to the manifestations of God's anger towards them, I'm certain they would be more interested in the gospel. They would be. But their hearts have become so hardened that they have no fear of God. None whatsoever. You hear it almost every day. You see it almost on everything you watch in the media. In our day here in the Western world, the Christian message is about the love of God. And very little is said about the wrath of God. And I believe that's a problem. That's not good. Because until you realize and understand the wrath of God, the gospel message is not fully grasped. And the Savior, what he provides, is not fully grasped. And you know, a study of the concordance in the concordance, that's where it lists all the words that are found in the Bible and where you can find them. 
it shows that there are more references in Scripture to the anger, fury, and wrath of God than there are references to the love of God. Yes, more about his, his anger and fury and wrath than to his love and to his tenderness. When the Bible speaks of God's wrath, it's not speaking so much of an anger that quickly bursts into violence, but rather the wrath of God is something that builds up over a long time, like water building up behind a very large dam, which eventually, because of the pressure, explodes. But it takes time for the pressure to build up. And that's the kind of wrath that the Bible talks about when it's talking about God. And certainly in the book of Revelation, it describes the final outpouring of God's wrath with its un unleashed fury. And the wrath that the Apostle Paul is talking about here in Romans is that of God's firm, fearsome hatred of all wickedness. And it's building up, and it's building up, and it's building up. And one day the result in the eternal condemnation of all who are not justified by Christ's righteousness will come to a head. God's wrath will come upon those who reject him. Verses 18 to 20. Those who reject him by suppressing the truth about God, it's plain that, that which is plain to see. You cannot look into the heavens. You cannot walk through the woods. You cannot observe nature without seeing a creator. God naturally reveals himself this way. And so often we replace this truth with our own fantasies. Mother Nature, in other words, we have. Denying God his existence and rule. He deserves our worship. He deserves our obedience. But we reject it. The truth about God is visible. It's all around us. It can be understood by reflecting on what is seen. If you have ever seen a child being born, you can see creation. You can see God's hand. And it's been ongoing ever since it all started. It reveals God's eternal power and divine nature. God has chosen to reveal himself just by what we see. Generally in nature, more specifically through the scriptures. He's given us his word. He sent Christ into the world. There's no excuse not to be aware of God. No excuse. As the psalmist says in 19, Psalm 19, beginning at verse 1 to 4, the heavens are telling the glory of God. They are a marvelous display of his craftsmanship. Day and night they keep on telling about God. Without a sound or word, silent in the skies, their message reaches out to all the world. You see, nature reveals a God of might, a God of intelligence, a God of intricate detail, a God of order and beauty and power. The design implies a designer, a creator, yet so many reject him. And those who reject God in turn create their own God. Verses 21 to 23. When you reject God, you create your own God. Although they know of God because it's obvious, they do not acknowledge him nor seek him to know him, they reject him. And failing to recognize God leads to failing to thank him for all we have, for all of life itself. They never look to God. They never give him thanks. And ingratitude is the leading edge. It's the leading edge towards the steep spiral decline into depravity when we are in ungrateful when we don't give thanks to God, we forget God, and we often replace him with ourselves. With ourselves. Self is elevated. And as we elevate self, it brings along, it brings along futile thinking, darkness, pride, and departure from all that God is. When darkness reigns, the light of God cannot be seen. 
and futile thinking is followed by futile living. Wisdom. Man's wisdom becomes foolishness. God is replaced, is replaced with other stuff. And this is idolatry. Here in the Western world, we do not see blatant idolatry as frequently as you might in Asia or Africa. Most of us do not set up statues and pray to them or offer incense or gifts before them. But there are many other forms of idolatry that are very evident. If you use God for what he can give you and then you set him back on the shelf until the next time you need him, you're doing the same thing that idolaters do with their idols. They only bring them out when they need them. We can also fall into an idolatry of things that otherwise are good. Some people, in effect, worship the family. God gives us our families, and they are good in, in, in their proper perspective. But if we rely in, on family in the place of God, so that we can only find fulfillment and happiness in our families, we have fallen into idolatry and are not following Jesus as Lord. The family moves up above. I see it. You see it too. Material possessions are a good gift from God. It's not wrong to enjoy material possessions. But if we put our hope in things or in our investments, and that's where our trust is and not in God, we have fallen into idolatry. It can be our vocation. It can be entertainment. It can be sports, computers, TV. Many things can dominate our lives and become idols, taking the place that God alone deserves. This is the root sin. Rejecting the truth of God and worshiping that which is created instead of the creator. How is it possible? How is it possible for intelligent humans to turn to idolatry? It begins by rejecting what we know about God, what is very evident about God. That's where it starts. Instead of looking to him as creator and sustainer of life, we invent replacements. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Have you heard of the seesaw principle? You know, as a child, you went to the park, seesaw, up and down, depending on who was heavier, depending on whether you were up or down. <laughs> the seesaw principle. If one end is up, the other is down. And if we elevate God, the other end is down. Elevate God and lowers man the way it should be. But our exaltation, our up will come in Christ. For when we stand in judgment with Christ, we will be seen through Christ. And all that is his is ours. And all that is seen as him is seen in us. Elevate man and it lowers God. God in our mind and hearts disappear. And we have no way of reaching God. And we will have to stand in the judgment on our own merit. Luke 18, 14, second part says, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And there, my friends, I believe is the crux for many people. They're not prepared to humble themselves and accept God and allow God to be placed above and over them. When God is rejected and other gods take his place, then God the Almighty abandons them to their own vile passions. Verses 24 to 32. He abandons them to their own vile passions. Because of their rejection of God, he lets them go in their own folly and degradation. In essence, God releases them to their own desires. And many a parent has had to do this with a wayward child. It finally comes to the point as a parent, you have to say, 
pack your bags and go. If you're not willing to toe the line here and, and be part of the family, then you cannot stay. And I see God saying the same thing. He does the same thing. He releases you. That's what you want. And if that's what you're pushing for and that's what you want, he says, go, go. As in the, as in the story of the prodigal son who wanted his inheritance and go. That was an absurd thing to ask. His father hadn't passed away yet. And yet he wanted his inheritance. The father gave it to him and let him go. And God lets people go. These desires are focused upon, we see in verse 26, shameful lusts. And a depraved mind in verse 28. And the list of human sinfulness becomes very long and very messy and stinky. In essence, what is being driven home is that the evidence of God's wrath against humanity is already self-evident. It's already taking place with the list of sins that are plain to see in our midst. This is what happens when we abandon God, when we reject God. And we go the way of sin and we just let it flourish. We pay the price. Sin is already running its course. Humanity is in trouble. And as a result of shameful lusts, no person, relationship, or part of creation has been left untouched. There is no hierarchy of sin. Sin is sin. There's no little sins and big sins. Sin is sin. And it all comes out of our rebellion against God. In verse 29, and the verses after that, it talks about every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, which is evil for good, gossip, slander, hating God, being insolent, that is to be rude, disrespectful, insulting. Wow, look at the internet today and social media. Rude, disrespectful, insulting. Oh my goodness. I know many of you are not on it, but if you are, you'll see that. Arrogant, boastful, invent ways of doing evil, disobeying a parent, senseless, unable to discern spiritual, moral things, ruthless. What a mess. And to top it off, even though they know better, they continue in it. And they even encourage others to do the same in verse 32. Join us, come along, this is the way to go. We know the outcome. It is death. It's spiritual, eternal death. But they still carry on. It's like the dangers of smoking. We are all, it's all very well documented and proven. And yet many still ignore and smoke. The end of sinful living and a life with God, we know what the end will be. Eternal death. Romans 6.23, when people sin, they earn what sin pays. Death. Worse yet, they applaud, approve, and encourage others to do the same. Come. They want company. You see, as Matthew 7.13 says, the highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many that choose to go that way. And Paul, a little later in Romans 6, 23, puts it this way. When people sin, they earn what sin pays. Death. But, but, God gives us a free gift. Life forever in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. You know, today as the pandemic continues to ravage the world, Political leaders and medical personnel keep telling us to isolate, stay at home, only do what is essential, nothing more. We all know what to do. The message has been coming at us for a year now. It's not that people don't know. Not only do they know, they know what to do, they know that. They also know what the consequence can be. We've also been told that. You can also see that. Yet people still go and socialize anyway. They do it anyways. 
And in the same light, people know about God. They know. He's very plain to see. People also know very well about sin. We all know it, whether we admit it or not. And we also know the consequence. And yet, they go on living however they want, with no apparent concern. They all know they will die one day, and yet they live as if they will go on forever. But there is a way of escape. It's found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe, and he'll change your life today. Believe, and he'll change your life forever. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. He's done it all. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, the book of Romans, what a powerful book. He pulls out all the stops. He pulls out all the punches. Lord, have mercy upon our world. Have mercy upon the many who have yet not acknowledged you, who continue to reject you, who continue to, to ignore you. I believe in this pandemic, you're, you're knocking at everyone's door. You're knocking at the whole world. And the whole world still does not listen, nor look, nor acknowledge you. And because we don't, we pay the price. We will continue to pay the price. Only you, O oh God, can have mercy on us, I pray. Have mercy. Forgive us our sin. May people's hearts and minds and soul be open to acknowledge you, to accept you, and to realize you are the one who made them, that you are their creator and you know them as no other knows them. And I pray that we will accept your offer in Jesus Christ, and that we would be reconciled to you and begin to live life with you, a life that can be so wonderful, so wonderful we can't even describe it, Lord. And it doesn't end, it will go on forever. And I pray, O oh God, that you would be merciful to this world that you would help people to turn to you, that you would do all you can for them to get, for you to get their attention. And so I pray that your word will go forth this day in this way from this place and that it will do its work that you have intended for it to be done. We honor you, O God. You are the Almighty. There is none other besides you. This is your will. This is your world and your will will be done. Bless each one just here in your presence now. May they truly come to know you if they do not already. And if they do, Lord, I pray that you will strengthen them and encourage them in their inmost being. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.